what's out there and, and how it's compared and stuff like that. That's okay. what I've been doing for you. Hey guys. Hello, Martian. Hey, Martian. How are you? Let's do doing it. good. Yeah. Um, I've been, uh, I know you sent me something in my email, like kind of a outline. That yeah. Uh, no, we want to continue from where we left off uh, last time. So, so uh, collaboration with MSI and collaboration. If we could, can do something like a chapter with you guys or something like that, if you guys are interested. So, I think that we left off on on uh, the the COVID equipment stuff. So maybe we can yeah, wrap that up, up and go right in right in. Where we left I off. actually rewatched our recording, so thanks for recording it. Yeah. So that I re remember everything. Mm hmm. And uh, and I like how you take notes in the wiki. Yeah. Um, I'm trying to get to the wiki now, actually. Let's see. Let's see here. Should be in here in machines, right? Just going to machines and. Or is the wiki separate? Uh, so let me send you a link here. Okay. Thanks. And then, yeah, there was something wrong with my audio and video last time because I tried to use some other softwares later that same day and they just got totally wigged out. I needed to restart and then everything was all right. So this is working great today. Show Good. chat. There we go, great. Okay, let's put this in this tab over here. We're ready to go. I got a really acute cold, like I just got sick on Saturday and I just laid in bed and, and then it just went away. So I'm not gonna die. <laughs> That's good. The, the, um, the uh, surge in number of people getting uh, COVID-19 has got me really worried. And Chicago is opening up stuff too fast in my opinion. And then as soon as they go to a different phase, everybody in my building thinks they can stop wearing a, a mask. It's really stupid indoors like we're on top i live in a high-rise apartment with a high density of people and i don't know if i told you last time they, they get into the lobby and they take their mask off because they think they're home and i'm like how do you tell them like that's the worst time to take off your mask because you got all this everybody's trapped together there's all kinds of particles in there and uh so i'm wearing my uh full respirator again because i think there's going to be a surge i might lose my job because of this if we can't open the museum back up, they're going to have to make more cuts. They already cut 200 people. And the people are not taking it seriously. And um, Republicans, you want to return to business? Then make everybody wear masks. That's how you return to business. Yeah. you got to get rid of the COVID-19. They're just so... For the museum, is it... Uh, do people pay for admission? That's its revenue? Yeah, that's huge. That's a huge hmm. amount of money. That, that keeps the... Basically, the admission keeps the building standing. Hmm. And Very then everything else beyond that, we have to get grants or other things. That's like a huge building, right? Um, so, yeah. So I'm I'm going. I'm I think we're going to be going back into phase two, uh, and so they're always a little bit behind. So I'm starting to gear up more heavily, and we're going to stay inside. I was starting to go outside a little bit, but I was in the park, and this guy started like walking up to me and touching me and stuff the other day. I'm like, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, anyway, but I've been having a good day today. I was just telling Andreas that I'm getting a bunch of stuff done. I'm excited about my CNC foam cutter. And so, yeah, let's talk about the, um, oh yeah, this is cool. I just got one of these today. It's on the next topic we're going to talk about. So we have this uh, decentralized node system. And uh, today I got from a local high school teacher who lives nearby me, she dropped off a whole bunch of uh, frames that she printed. Mm -hmm. There's a whole bag of them. Uh, and so I'll send these to another node and they'll be finished and then given to uh, medical workers because the hospitals are still very busy with COVID-19 patients and they still need PPE. So to, so, to yeah, with that discussion, so, so the actual design, where is that design that you're actually using? You wanna send a link to that? And yeah, so, it doesn't really matter actually so like i just i'm looking in here i see the prusa design yeah mm -hmm. here's six pla prusa design ones okay cool great somebody will wear those then we have uh nih we have three nih approved designs 
Mm -hmm. Those are nice because they got the top cover so that uh, mist doesn't come down and get onto your N95. Mm -hmm. And then you got, uh, oh, there's more. There's four, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 17 face shields. So off of somebody's uh, printer they brought home from the school. What else they got in here? Probably should be a little careful. It's been a couple days sitting around, but I, I got to wash my hands. Which is the NIH and design? Do you have a link for that? So just go to the NIH National Institutes of Health website, and then they'll have at the top of their page they'll have the 3D printing repository. Mm -hmm. And then they have the NIH approved ones are first, where they've done actual splash testing with them. And I'll be done washing my hands here in a moment. Very cool. Um, in terms of getting, you know, any kind of um, coordination on this, you mentioned that. So, is the Illinois PPE network that that's still active and running, or how is it going right yeah. now? Yeah. Oh yeah, it's going strong. Mm -hmm. I, I ran uh, my node, which was the most productive uh, 3D printing node, even to date. Even though I stopped, uh, so I made 10 percent of the total output and. In two and in fifty-one days. Is there any so, revenue model involved with this? So this is just people paying out of their pocket, or how does that work? How do um, the finances yes. work to get materials? So the um, my initial prints were the filament was purchased by the Jesuit priests of DePaul because they gave one of my hacker friends who runs the hackerspace at DePaul University. They gave him a hundred thousand dollars immediately to keep running things because they realized it was going to help the community. Um, and I, I'm a former Catholic and now a, an atheist, but the Jesuit priests really care about the community around them. They're really smart. You might have heard of them before. And so they provided a lot of funding. And then they uh, allowed uh, Jay to remove all the 3D printers from his makerspaces throughout DePaul, and then students ran them in their homes. Throughout DePaul? What's DePaul? DePaul's a university. Okay. Yeah, DePaul University. It's very, it's very well known in Chicago, yep, so yep. that's why we did, I just say DePaul, and um, it's huge. It's a, it's a, it's a private uh, college. It's, I'd say it's almost Ivy League. If it isn't, it's probably Ivy League. And so, and then I, when DePaul released their printers, and a couple other universities released their printers, that allowed me to release get the printers out of MSI. And then I went and picked up all those printers. And now the Illinois PP network, which you have a link to it in your notes, I think, right? Uh, oh, no, you don't. Let me give you that. Oh, that's the Slack group. I don't want to go to that. God, I hate Slack. Jesus. So here's the website for it. And it's it works, you guys will be familiar with this. It's like an open source mesh network. Um, so we don't have any centralized control. Here, let me send a message and you can add that to the notes. Okay. And then this explains how it works here. And if you look on the media section, you can watch the videos and stuff on us. But I think you, if you haven't watched it already, um, you want in your notes, you have it to make zine plan C, binge making. You should read that whole series because that will explain how we ran things. Um, but to put it in summary, there is no central control node in the Illinois PP network. We, on the Illinois PP network, you can see you can click on a button, I can make. And if you click on that, it uh, goes to a, um, I forget what it's called, something table. It's Airtable. And then Airtable, that propagates into Airtable. And then uh, once you 3D print some stuff, you just send it to your nearest node. You just drop it off on their doorstep. So there's no contact drop off. Now what I'll do is, let's say I, I got these uh, frames I just showed you from a teacher. I'm going to move those to another node that can add the transparencies and the headband. Or I might finish this. I might assemble them, actually, because I have some materials here still. And then uh, when a request comes in from a hospital, 
the node nearest to the hospital delivers. And if that node runs out of materials to deliver to the hospital, then they go to the daily meeting or they go onto the Slack group and they say, hey, I don't have enough to complete this order. And then somebody will move parts from another another uh, node over to another node and then it gets delivered. And then uh, it's basically was started by, I'd say about 12 hackers in Chicago started this group because we're the only ones that will take the risk. Government wasn't doing the job at any level from federal all the way down to local and we gave them a chance and they 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 failed and weren't able to uh, tell us where they're going to move our parts if we're going to let them handle them because then they could have taken credit for them and then we would have that would have been helpful for us because we would have had some political power then that's why we wanted to do it that way because mm -hmm. political power goes a long way and so we just continue to do it ourselves and then uh, we're now i'm not really helping with this effort but they're working on masks because that's all sewing and stuff like that. Now, I know how to sew, and I know how to do that stuff, but um, it's time for me to focus back on work because we're doing a lot of uh, getting ready for a lot of online training. I'm helping with training, you know, like I said last time, the guys that recently got released from prison, how to do 3D printing. So I'm shifting gears into, into an area where there isn't other people that have the same expertise as me. Mm -hmm. you know? There's a lot of sewing experts out there that can be handled by the community. How many nodes are there? Um, there's a map on here somewhere, so let's, uh, let's see here. Home. The website is better than it used to be, but... Uh, oh yeah, here it is. So if you go to the main home page, how does this work? If you slide down there, and then mm -hmm. check out the active nodes on this map. You see that link? Uh, Here, why don't I just put it in the in the thing so that you can put I it see in your the, notes? This just got three nodes there. Oh, active nodes on this map there. Ah. Yeah. There you go. Oh yeah, the Peoria Peoria node. So we mm. we we've, we've even started to get request. We've been delivering stuff to hospitals in Indiana. Even, and then just for context, there's another node up in Milwaukee, north of us, but it's it's a or a different group. So each state has a certain number of these groups doing this work. And that Plan C by Dale Doherty talks about the entire global movement of, of Plan C makers from Europe to the United States. And he does a really good job. It's a huge story. And there's a lot of detail out to talk about. Mm -hmm. And I think that, you know, it's, it would be interesting for you to look at and see when, if COVID-19 gets bad enough in a rural area, you might want to start making some of this stuff and working with the nodes. How do they coordinate? Is there like an email list? Slack. Our group does it through Slack. Each group uses a different. So Illinois PPE decided on Slack. Cool. That's what we use. Another group might be Google Groups or something else. Each group uses something different. Um, we've heard a lot of problems from other nodes trying to have centralized control. And that's why we decided to do a decentralized mesh network. But it does still require coordination. So we have um, Ray Doxson. Let me send you. He's a really cool guy. You'll probably want to put a link on him. He might be interested in talking to you guys too. So he's a former. Um, he was a soldier in Afghanistan. He was actually safety uh, officer. So he has really good skills for coordination, and he works for the with the VFW. He's a VFW officer, Veterans of Foreign War. Do you know what that is? Yeah. Yeah, so he's a VFW Hall, and then he has the couriers that we use are former veterans. So he just gives them an order, and they come to my house, they pick up the stuff, and then they bring it to the hospital like clockwork. It's awesome. And we also use, uh, for really short distances, we use bike couriers um, because a bunch of uh, bicycle racers. So I'm an amateur bicycle racer, and a bunch of the people in the group are as well. So for a long time, we, we were just shooting everything around with uh, bicycle, bicycle messengers, and they have no work right now. So they're sitting at home and they're, you know, full of adrenaline and want to get out. So they love it. They get on their bikes and move stuff around. Were you going to send the link or? Yeah, Ray Doxson. Okay, let's see here. Let's do. Uh, do so which one is your node? Uh, South Suburban Network? There. I might not be on there. Because I was a manufacturing node only. So I'm not really supposed to. 
No, no, I'm there. I'm the 811 Uptown Node. I'm right by the lake and north of Chicago. Actually, there's a... Yeah, there it is. Yep. I'm the MSI lake Chicago view? 811. MSI, um, uh, MSI Chicago, yeah. Yeah. 811, Uptown. The neighborhood that I live in is Uptown. Um, the what do you city say South Chicago? Chicago? Put up in, you said South Chicago you, is the, the MSI? So the MSI is not operating a node because they won't let me open up the fab lab. I was trying to get them to do that, but they won't listen. So Chicago Peace Fellows are the two nodes that I sent all my production to because okay. the south side of Chicago is getting tons of COVID-19 cases because it's African-American people and we always ignore them over and over again. And Peace Fellows is, is what, just somebody's home or what is that? That's run by Jackie Moore, who has been a uh, community activist since the 60s. Yeah. She's an older, older woman that's a friend of mine. And she's awesome. And she runs a uh, robotics club and a bunch of other stuff. She's involved with the churches. Nice. Um, churches, I'm sure, I think in rural areas, two churches are really powerful organizations that really help people. So we were, even though the, the museum is non-denominational and neutral, on religion we work with a lot of churches on the south side of chicago because they're the only organizations that are actually helping the community mm -hmm. the government the alder people and all that just blow it off how many uh how many pieces of pp have you produced so far for the network eight thousand are you on trying 20 to printers <laughs> on 20 printers you mentioned something about um getting some kind of a mechanism where you pay people to to actually do this so get some funding from various organizations is anyone working on that yeah um a bunch of the notes are and then uh jackie moore who runs the chicago peace fellows she has been selling masks and, and selling to who to hospitals or to indiv just on a web store or something individuals so the masks are for individuals it's a much larger scale project the face shields are mainly for workers medical workers but we've also sent dentists and we've done food service workers um, so the face shield n95 mass combination is what's needed in work environments but for a general public everybody needs a mask so that that's part of the reason why i stepped away from that too because i have a friend of mine too uh, in beverly uh, it's a south uh, neighborhood of chicago uh, Brian Diazinak, he is a fashion designer and has owned boutiques for years. Him and his uh, nieces have been cranking out designer face masks like crazy. And they have like branding on them and like they, they look fancy. Um, so there's a lot of people making masks. Um, is anyone I, making them out of 3D printers or everyone sewing? <clears throat> everything's pretty much switched over to sewing. If you go online, there's a lot of people doing really cool designs like flat uh, flexible fabric uh, fl or flex filament ones that sew up and have three dimensions to them. Here, let me show you one of my mods. Um, what my opinion is is that we should be using paint respirators. You ever you probably use paint respirators yeah. from time to time in your work, right? Yeah. Those are awesome, and I don't understand why the government doesn't talk about these. Well, so, they're a little more complex as far as. If you're to make it, yeah, it definitely should make them. They're more industrial well, performance. Well, I don't think we should make them. You can still. I've been buying these. Yeah. So I've been purchasing these. Oh yeah. And then what I have, what I have here is I have, as you know, probably you have the you have the intake on both sides, right? So when you inhale, you suck air through these cartridges. Yeah. And then when you exhale, it dumps out the exhale port. That is a problem because we don't know, I don't know if I have COVID-19 or if I'm gonna transmit it. So I 3D printed an N95 filter for the exhaust port. You put some electrical tape around it and you jam it in there. Here, let me pull it out. Yeah. It's really in there tight. Let's see here, because I don't want it to leak. So here's my N95 homemade 3D printed item. So, and then this, I can't touch my eyes either. I touch my face all the time. And that's really bad because you can get the virus in your eyes and then you got it, right? Right. And you, you just look, you know, just look in any basic biological warfare manual, and it tells you exactly what you need to do. What is the formula for the CBR, Chemical Biological Radioactive Filter? 
That's what you're, well, you're using. That, you're not going that far. No, right? no, 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 no. <laughs> so the only reason I have these on here, these cartridges, because they're standardized. So these are um, part of. Wait, wait, what are these? These are for like painting. So and they last quite a while. The N95 is sitting on top of it. And the N95 you get from where? You can get them from anywhere. They're, they're, they're these discs. They're really cheap. So let me show you those. And then also, if I need to wear my glasses, I got a half mask, which is what a lot of people use for painting. Same thing on the half mask. I got to modify this one. I just got to put an exhaust port filter on the, let me turn this down. I need to put in, uh, the same thing where I can jam in an exhaust port filter. Yeah. So, so I mean, what you're, what you're spewing forth is there's a lot of technical know-how in there. Is this documented somewhere that that anyone can get their hands on or this is I, I don't think you you don't need to know it if you have an N95 filter here, here I'll tell you what the documentation is it's in the manual for the respirator I'll show you it actually so what people need to know is how to do a fit test um, let me grab my I'm, I'm gonna grab my extra masks here they're in a drawer in here let's see here uh, and then I also have because there's been a lot of, I've been thinking about protesting. So then I can use that same setup and you just add an acid gas cartridge to it so that you, if you get tear gassed, you're protected because I've been tear gassing people a lot. Regarding so um, the Black Lives Matter stuff or COVID yeah, related? Right. Mm -hmm. right. They like to tear, they like to tear gas the protesters and then trap them and arrest them. So let's see here. This is the N95 filter which mm -hmm. is like two dollars a piece mm -hmm. and you can buy whole bags of them from mcmaster car yeah so now let me show you the fit test procedure okay so i'm going to set this down So I was pretty fast at it because I've done it a lot. So what I did is I put my hand over the exhaust port and I applied pressure outwards and then you can feel if air is leaking out of your seal around your face. And then you tighten it up until you no longer have leakage. Now you're ready to go. You can go into an environment, like I've worked in industrial environments where you would inhale some kind of gas, it'd be bad for you. Um, now you know you're not gonna do that. You can go into that environment. Where's the air escape if you hold the exhaust? Um, it, there's it'll another, burp out of this. There's another no, it spot, doesn't. Right? It doesn't. It doesn't escape at all. So you're you're closing it off. And you're pressurizing the whole face piece or the half face piece, and then if air blows out, you'll it'll you'll hear it vibrate and go outside of your face. Especially yeah, the but if you're breathing giving. in, where's the out outgoing breath go? I mean, okay, yes. So if you want to do the other, the reverse fit test, you're exactly right. Then you would cover these ports. And you oh, so you're inhale. breathing in at that point. You're I was in inhalation. This is, this is blow out fit test here, and this is breathe in fit test. That's it. It's in the manual. Yep. And the manual you're referring so, to is what? What's the manual you're referring to? For any full face piece um, or half oh. face piece. You, just, you can look it up, respirator fit testing. Um, and the reason why... And then the hospitals have a more complicated one, which I think is stupid, because in industry, you know, people are going around chlorine gas and all kinds of heavy gases, and that's the fit test they do, and then they go into the environment, and do their work, yep. done. Can it's the same thing that if you're in in uh, the army or something like that, you do a similar fit test. It's real fast, and then you're ready to go. Yeah. So l maybe we can move on to the agenda item since it's it's almost one thirty already. Um, yeah. So, what's what's to be said about altogether this uh, PPE work? Uh, is there stuff to learn regarding, like, I don't know, like, say we wanted to get people from the community here to to produce stuff mm -hmm. and actually hire them, pay them. Uh, what are are there? Is there any guidance on like how would you fund that, for example? Well, the first thing I would do is talk to your hospitals and see what they need, right, and then and then determine if the community wants to wear face masks. 
uh, or masks, right? Cloth masks. Then if you have a market, then I'd say, then you start making what they want. So for mm -hmm. us, the Swedish Covenant face shield was what we made because the Swedish Covenant hospitals, there's three of them approved that and worked with us on the design. And then every other hospital wanted it in Chicago. So you want to produce what's needed and you have to ask if what they need. And at first they'll kind of be like, what? And then, you, then you're like, okay, just give them the Prusa face shield maybe. Um, and or print the Swedish Covenant one and make one. Give and then we found out if we gave the hospital a sample pack, we drop off ten of them assembled, and then they'd start making orders once they saw the. So um, I'm going to send you two links. I'm going to do Ray Dokinson first, and then I'm going to send you the links to the two designs that I yep. really like. And you don't have any any pro like any formal protocols. This is just like standard stuff. You just got to go out there and do it, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's just all action-based. Yeah. Ask what people need and make it, which is what you guys are good at that already. Okay, so here is Ray Dokson. Um, he'd be happy to talk to you about logistics, although I don't think logistics are going to be complicated for you guys. You know, dealing with hospitals in a city is a lot more complex because you're going to have a couple hospitals in your area and then you'll get to know them. So that's an advantage that you have being in a rural, rural area. And then let's give you the. Is there link a person? To, there's a typically at a hospital. Who do you call? It's a. Is it a? There's a logistics or like sourcing person. What's that yeah. person called? Logistics or sourcing, exactly. Purchasing. Purchasing. Yeah. Okay. And then um, what's the Sweet Covenant face shield? I'm going to send you actually Richard Bynes uh, site. Let's see, I have a. COVID-19 tab here actually. Do you know if there's any at this point is there any certified pappers? Maybe you should look at the NIH page. I believe there's some on there. A lot of people have been taking uh, snorkel diving masks and converting them to pappers. Um, I helped my friend, one of my nurse friends, convert uh, a snorkel mask to a pepper. Pappers are really good for working directly around COVID-19 patients. Yeah, there's definitely some uh, some content there. Not FDA approved or anything. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a lot more complex to approve of. And also, if they approve a papper and it damages somebody's lungs, they'll get real, in really bad trouble. So most people, in my experience, nurses have been modifying them themselves and wearing them themselves and taking their own risk. That's what my nurse friend did. And then they eventually got in the mail, they got a, a full-blown papper, and then they switched to that, and then they gave their other one to somebody else. So, so Richard Byen, I want to I want to send you to his source page instead of some other. He's got a company, a design company, and his. Uh, That's cool. Page. Like the so the NIH page has things from all over the world, actually. That's good. Yeah. I'm having trouble finding it here. Oh, that's so cool. Amazing. And okay, it, there are peppers, and it's uh, holy cow. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Very good. I'm wondering what what has been done for the full face shield part if that actually works already or they're just using one off the shelf cuz um I talked to the guy already in the EMT here he said it'd be he'd be into pappers if we could make them Yeah I would suggest let me send you the link to the snorkel well, based like pepper That's pretty much home. Yeah so I got to take a look at this pretty cool Um yeah, let's see here Where is Richard's page Oh here it is Jesus yeah, I want to like get a papper for welding. I mean, CBR. Yeah, right. CBR welding right. papper with yeah. the headgear construction set. Like, this you got your welding mask, you can replace like the lens that are the welding lens that are mm -hmm. auto darkening, or you can put, use that for grinding or whatever. So, like a multi purpose hat. So, there's a Swedish face shield covenant, covenant face shield one. I'd suggest that one for starting out with and providing samples. Um, there is some issue where there needs to be something on top, which he has a print file for that as well. So if you check out his uh, his site, Ray um, Doxson. 
Uh, Ray Dokesons, if you want to talk about logistics later and how to talk to hospitals. And then the Limitless Studio, the link I just sent, Swedish Shield, is the is a really good shield. It was really optimized for 3D printing. And now, do you have any printers smaller than 200 by 200 millimeter plates? Do I say what? Do you have any small 3D printers? Or are they all big? Uh, we got 150 by 150. Oh, okay, yeah, here, and then I'm going to send you my design because it's, it's the Swedish Covenant design curled in for 150 by 150. Okay, so, you see Richard's page? Yep. Uh, well, no, I'm not there yet. Here, Limitless Studio. That's Richard? Yeah. So now go to slide down, and then he's got a whole bunch of information on how to make it and all that kind of stuff. The guy's a genius. He's super awkward and awkward and really quiet. But he did an awesome job. Uh, but it's non-commercial, so that means we couldn't sell it to a hospital. You should just ask him that. Say, hey, can we sell these to hospitals? And I bet he'd allow it. Also, he's most The spec for open website. source hardware just came out today, so no more fake open source. So how about you just print mine, the Chicago Shield, which is public domain. Yep. I'll give you that one. For free? I, I'm sick, I'm sick, I'm sick of that bullshit. So this stuff should be public domain. You know, like skip even open source, right? It's for saving people. Yeah. God. <laughs> All right. I'm uh, who's the guy at account. Swedish Shield? What's his name? Uh, Richard Bein, and I'll send it to you. It's really hard to spell. Okay, so there's some good stuff. Yeah. What it takes is just um, so assess the need locally. Um, now, if there is so if there's a market. Who pays for it? Sales? Yeah, I think probably sales pay for it. So, so say we want to uh, say hire locals, just get it from the revenue. Yes, uh, Richard Bine is very humble. So he didn't. He doesn't want to take credit for the design. Actually, he wants it to be used. That's why I can't understand. I don't know if he just forgot to license it properly or what. Hmm. Okay, so I'm gonna get into my design now, which is public domain. And then the, the same same thing with my uh, full face piece exhaust port and 95 filter, that's public domain as well. Oh, I have a norm frame one too. I have, I have here's the two you want, because they're both public domain. So here's the one for large printers that I designed. And you can also print them in very efficient stacks. Okay, so this is, oh, this is a remix of, yeah, so here's mine. Here's the one for big printers, which, where's the license? Yeah, public to, public domain. And then let's go back. And I spent a lot of time, this is, the, these are the best ones, just use these. Because I actually have, they're for 0.3 layer heights, so they print really fast and they're strong. There's people printing stuff at fine. I think it's rigid. It's a waste of time. And then um, here's the uh, Chicago Shield. And that one's public domain as well. And that's for the 150 by 150 millimeter printers, which this was huge. It, and it, it, hundreds of printers came online because of the Chicago face shield frame. Now you and there's instructions here. It's fully documented on the Thingiverse page. So if you the Chicago sheet needs to be heated up in an oven, and you need to bend them out, and it shows the uh, shows the items there. And I also have the cooling fixture is in there too, which can be printed on a larger printer, and then it can be reused over and over and over again. And there's pictures in the Thingiverse page. So this one's very well documented. The uh, the Chicago Shield. Where do you get your transparencies? Um, let's see here. That's a really good question. And I'm going to send you Elastic, too. Um, I got the Elastic locally because I got tired of waiting for it to come from some other place. So it's the no, Elastic, produced. you can just print that, too, if you want. That's right. I mean, the filaments are elastic like that if you print them thin. Yeah, but I didn't want to spend any time doing that when I could just add on to it. I want to produce as many frames as possible. So that's why I bought, and it's so cheap if you buy it in bulk. Mm -hmm. So let's see here. We got uh, Lee and socks for elastic. Um, they're in Des Plaines, Illinois. They ship really fast. You probably could find a local 
uh, you could ask, call Lee and Sox for the elastic, and then say, hey, do you know if there's anybody locally by me in Missouri? That and they would tell you. They're real nice. So Lee and Sox is for elastic, and then we want um, we want uh, transparencies. <sighs> Okay, so the transparencies are in Michigan, and they they have like an endless supply of them. Because some people are like ordering off Amazon, and like they're out of stock, and then they start raising the prices on them. You know how that stupidness works. So let's see here. I need to open up my um, my spreadsheet of suppliers. I'll be there in a second. I almost wonder if you have any clothing manufacturers nearby you if you work with them to get masks made and then you 3D print the face shield stuff so let's see here we want um, we want orders fab lab orders So to answer your funding question again, the, the funding for my face shields eventually came from the museum. They gave me a $5,000 budget, and then an anonymous donor gave me another $5,000. So I had 10 grand total for the 50, 51 days that I operated. I still have budget left, and now I'm spending it on filament for the printers that the, that the South Side folks are using. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's see here. I got my COVID-19 orders. I got to go to the that The 140 tab. millimeter frame, so you print them stacked? A bunch of them? Yeah, 15 at a time. And then I was making uh, between 300 and 600 per 24-hour period at max rate. Wow. It was nuts. Right. It was awesome. Yeah, and then, and then I started assembling full kits later on. Once I got used to running the machines and repairing them, because they would break down once in a while. And then I would just whole punch stuff and so uh, if you start make, the making them get in contact me, with me again and I can tell you about where to get hold I got a $20 whole punch I'll just send you the I'll send you the supplier send the for the BOM uh, send that BOM spreadsheet the ones um, that you print on a small bed those things are with standard holes for ready transparencies that already have the holes in them no it's expensive to have um, oh you got I didn't have enough money for that so yeah so I, and if you're printing you're running a print farm I'm waiting 11 hours. I have 11 hours to print, you know, 600 transparencies. I finished them in like an hour, hole punching them manually myself. This mm -hmm. is uh, some, something you can have the print farm operator run. Okay, here it is. Yeah, I'm going to send you the bomb now. So I'm going to send, let's see if this works. You can put it right into your notes. This is going to be weird. Did that work? That's like Chicago land? That? Or what this this planes? Oh yeah, Chicago land for this rubber rubber band. Yeah, let me send you. I'm gonna send you the elastic. So now I'm gonna do. I'm gonna send. Oh yeah, you, okay. That's the. I just sent you the hole punch. So I'm sending you the bomb now. Pieces, because there's stuff in between that doesn't make any sense, like for running my machines. And then here's the uh, actual Lee and socks. Uh, elastic I used. I'm gonna send that next, and then yeah, that's it. So that's the hole punch, the elastic, and then I should send you the filament. Um, I have a preferred filament provider, which interestingly it was Colorfab, and they um, ship faster than any domestic supplier to me, and the quality of their filament is unbelievably awesome which you really need when you're running 20 printers 11 hours at a time actually 22 hours every day so they're only down for two out one hour in each 11 hour period so you cannot afford to have any crap in your filament it ruins it like clogs or machines and then you're working on machines all the time so i just sent you the boss eg squeeze did you get did you get those in yeah. the i mean these are so just are those links 
Those are the bomb. That's the bomb for what you need to make everything. They're not links, they're just text. Right? Uh, you should be able to slide over. You should be able to copy them fully. Like, let's see, that's what I was yeah. worried about, that it wouldn't work. Oh, yeah, you can. If you do it, if you go down and select it, let me just send another message down to here. You can you can drag and select everything. So if you go from the boss edge and drag it down to, down to here, you'll get it all. And you can copy and paste it into your notes. Oh, you drag it into the chat box? Uh, you can just drag select everything in the chat box. So if you go, f if you highlight bosses, easy squeeze, and then drag down to down to here, and then down copy to, where? to the type of message. Yeah, and then just copy that and paste it over. I'm trying to think of another way I could send it to you too. No, no, I got it. You got it. Okay. I should really put the the bomb into the Thingiverse page. I'll do that after we're done. So, for example, the transparencies, they cost um, $9 for 100 And I was ordering them, like, 12, 12 at a time. Because I was shipping out, like, 1,200, 2,000 fish a week. And then the other notes were having trouble ordering stuff. So, finally. Which I, I, I know about ordering and... I guess it's something I learned in manufacturing, how to connect with local suppliers, talk. Like, people won't pick up the phone anymore. Just call up and, at, and talk to somebody. That's how I got Lee and Sox. And she's like, oh, this is the best elastic. We have a lot of it in stock. Here you go. Is that uh, the black 1040 half-inch 2501? What is that? That's a Lee and Sox uh, elastic that I like. And so they're kind of an old school website, right? They're the yeah. kind of like place you call up and talk to. So you just tell me you want that part number. Do, by the way, do you have any um, any links for fiberglass sleeve? Different question. For for uh, for preventing hydraulic hoses from getting heat damage? No, this, this is other stuff, but this is for heater elements. Oh yeah. Um, I know McMaster car. Trying to find yeah. something better. That's the, what non, the stuff that doesn't uh, fray. Oh, you want you want you want silicone coated? No, wait a minute. Okay, so what are you doing? Like, with it? Tell me what you're. No, this is heater beds. Heater beds. So it have to go up to like 800 Fahrenheit or so, or 1,000 Fahrenheit rated kind of deal. Okay, Still looking for a good for... source of that beyond McMaster car, which is the fraying type. Anyway, so that's, I think, I have a lot of experience with this, so I think that you'd have a fiberglass insulation with a stainless steel wire braid around the outside is the only thing that's going to survive that. Because I know what you're talking about. If you just have the fiberglass sleeve, it d disintegrates as soon as it gets touched by something, right? Not really. It's frays. It's, it works. And just getting a better supply. It's the stuff that doesn't really fray because for fraying it's you get the dust in the air but don't worry about it now okay but let's let's move on here I got a definite cutoff in 45 minutes but let's cover maybe so thank you for the stuff on the PPE stuff that's good um, definitely worth looking into yeah I mean what I envision is um, I think probably get into just just uh, assessing some of the needs and producing some of these these items I mean, just even for ourselves as real products that we can either produce for ourselves um, and put it on our website if we're at it. Like, if we get really good at making it, we should be selling that too if we work out the, mm -hmm. the production very carefully and it really works well. So, so for the PPE, good. the Illinois, uh, most of the nodes now are asking for a donation for the face shields from the hospital, and the hospital's been happily giving that. And then for the masks, they're making profit because they, they, they're paying the people to sew them. Because that's really labor intensive, right, for somebody to make that. Mm -hmm. If the hospitals are paying for the face shields, what are they paying? Uh, I can't remember. It's enough to cover materials or, or more? I think it's like $2 a face shield, which the, each face shield costs about $0.45 cents to make without labor. 
So, yeah, I think they're asking for $2 a face shield. I was looking at Watlow. I don't know. You want that mineral insulation. Mineral fiber. fiber. I'm trying to... Th yeah, I'm getting a little distracted by the... Would your... Um, um, yeah, don't worry about that for now. That's another... Just story. order from McMaster Car, look at who makes it, and then order it directly from the place that yeah, makes yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, I actually did that. I was looking yeah. for other supplies because I could only find, like, one. One uh, Southern... Darn, Darko Southern in Texas. But anyway, uh, other story. So... Uh, what was the question I had on the... I think I've oh, heard yeah, that so Southern Dark Hole because there isn't very many people making that insulation. Yeah. Um, yeah. But anyway, on fat, fatter, fatter nozzles, would your mask work with we? Our standard here is 1.2 nozzles. Would that? Would your face shield work with that? Because then we can print it with. We do 0.4 layers and 1.2 nozzle sized as our industry standard at Factory Farm. Yeah, that's really good because you'll be able, you'll be able to. That'll be awesome because it'll, it'll be, be way faster. Like three times, we'll, yeah. we'll do like a hundred and then from one printer. I did an experiment with a 0.8 millimeter nozzle and it was really cool, uh, but then I started shutting down. So you would have to redesign my stack. So look at my stack design carefully, and you'll see it's made for 0.3 layers. That's very important. So you'd have to re. What's your layer height again? 0.4. Wow, why aren't you making thicker layers at 1.2 diameter nozzle? You should be making thicker layers. You can, you can uh, if you need the higher quality. But yeah, in this we can go not not a problem. Go to 0.6 one. or 0.8. Yeah, go to 0.8, and then you should make the serrations of between 0.8 tall. Okay, let me show you. here. Let me share my screen because if you're going to do this, you need to understand one critical part. Let's see here, let's go to the. Th let's see here, it's the fastest. So I also have the on shape file links. Um, on Can you export the the for me the step files from that? Yeah, you can do it yourself. Yeah. So let me double check that I got the on. I think the on shape link. Check on the Thingiverse page to make sure the on shape link is there. I believe it is for both designs because I'm going on shape right now to open them, and I'm going to share my screen so you can see it. Because there's one junction, there's a, there's a real important, very small detail that made a huge difference in being able to pull the frames apart. And it'll, ma it'll make sense once I show it to you. Okay. Oh, the video conferencing software is sucking on my bandwidth here. Maybe I should. S okay. Chicago shield frame. Okay, let's share the screen. Do that. Share screen. I'm going to do screen three. Share. I'm going to stop my video. I don't know that that should, that should be fine now. Why is it so slow? Maybe minimize you guys. There you go. You can still hear me, right? Yeah. This is taking too long. There we go. All right. So let's go to. Let's just zoom in here. Can you guys see that? Yeah. Okay. That surface is really important. There's a, sa a, a material saver there. If you don't have that slight divot, which should be as deep as your layer height, it will stick. Every single stack part will stick really bad and it'll tear it apart when you pull it apart. So you need to have a little air gap in there. So this I surface see. here, so let's, let's hide this so you can see how the mechanics work. Uh, hide. And so here's the serrations I modeled. So, so it's, it's the, the it's, it's the easy zip, zip apart and the integrity during printing, printing to make such a tall stack. It's very important. I size these serrations exactly right so they didn't grip too much. Yeah. And they yeah, didn't yeah. grip too little. And then this prevents the latent heat 
from, from solidifying, solidifying and sealing those two together, together. you got to move, you got to get those surfaces farther apart. Along here where the wall is a uniform thickness, they don't, don't stick together, but here they're sticking together, so I added that air gap. So that's, that's all you really need to know. know. So okay. what you would do is you would reestablish in these serrations instead of being, you know, these will be, let's see if I can grab that edge there, yeah. See, that's point three layer height right there. It's exactly point three high, so that it slices properly. If you do point eight, you have to have point eight, and then your all your pieces will be gapped apart point eight by these serrations. Otherwise, the slices will slice unevenly, and you'll get some parts stuck together and some parts just floating air. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. An expansion. How does explain expansion? How do you, how do you get it to not? How do you get that to work out? I'll show you on the first stage. So that's, that's all documented, documented there. Because that's pretty good, right? That's um, that's called 4D printing. Yeah, yeah sort of, right? right? And, and the fourth, fourth dimension, dimension of bending. bending. Not sort of, it is. Yeah. yeah. You're well, adding the dimension temporal is dimension. It's time. Yeah. Is, oh, oh, yeah, I guess, I guess it, is. it is. Okay. So here it is. And then, um, let's go full screen. Print them. Here's what you want to bend them to. Here's you can also just print a PDF template and bend them one at a time by heating them up. So let's see here. Oh, so you just so here. oh wait wait, but you do it manually. It's not auto. It it's doesn't expand by itself. No. You can figure out that part. <laughs> yeah, that's not really 4D. I'm sorry. Yeah, it's that's done just, manually uh, outside the machine. Time is handled outside the machine, the fourth dimension. Okay. Yeah. Oh, but so you this got this. Man. You got this expander jig, yeah. So you you know. Yeah. The... Yep. That's the that's the fixture. So that's nice. this file right here. So this uh, cooling fixture STL. Mm -hmm. And then here's the template PDF. So that's you could do you can do either one. Let's say you don't have a big printer and you're just alone printing. Then you just do the template and you can use chopsticks to bend them open. The cooling fixture just makes it a lot easier, especially when I was doing 600 a day. The cooling fixture made a lot. It was a lot nicer to use that. So I'm looking at the unshaped source, and do, do I have to sign in to? You have to make an account in order. Well, wait. You should be able to export it. Right click and export. Trying to do step export. Okay, export. And uh, keep in mind that. You can do, oh yeah, it worked. Let's see. Yeah, it's pretty awesome. It's too bad they don't open source the. Um, they should just open source on shape for free use and then have it closed source for commercial use. I don't know why they don't do that. I asked them to, and they were like, "Oh, they didn't want to do it." Oh yeah. It works. Okay. You got a step file. And then if you want to make parametric model changes, you can copy this whole thing. And if you create an Onshape account, then you can adjust it parametrically. parametrically. That's what I would suggest, because I did a lot of work on this assembly stack. So you could just copy my whole entire Onshape thing, and then you could go in there, and you could, uh, here's the support interface tab. The support interface tab is a separate model. Yeah, and you can just go in here and increase the height of these little nodes, and there's one dimension that controls all of them. Yeah. Okay. That was I'm like propagating them along lines, and it's, it's it was a pretty crazy project. But I finally just sat down one day and did it all because I realized it was important. Okay, we got to move on because we got 35 minutes. Okay. Let's go to next detail. Okay. Um, so collaborative projects. The thing I want to run by you is, is uh, so we're we're starting the notion of OSC chapters where we can teach people how to build printers or run steam camps, um, and do that as a business, as incorporated OSC chapters. So we're we're talking about that with Andreas for Sweden. Well, basically like serious chapter where it'll take you a bit of time. It's a year or two engagement to learn, uh, to learn what you need to to know. Uh, we've tried month-long, two-month-long immersions before. It's just not enough time for somebody to pick up all the skills to, to build and and produce a 3D printer and learn design in that time. 
Uh, so we're going to expand it to max it out to like a year or two. Um, I, I'd look at it as a year where the first year you really learn, learn, learn everything and then the, get the business up and running in the second year. So this is about training people to replicate the full operation of what we can do to generate revenue with th building 3D printers of different types and then adding new products. So the goal of this is to is to coordinate R&D so people so that OSC would have branches that develop product in different locations because right now it's uh, once again as I mentioned one of the big challenges is turnover people just don't don't stick around the deal for that is is uh, livelihoods and we can begin talking about livelihoods from the printer cell so my goal right now is to develop the 3D printer is a robust enterprise that I want to be selling, showing that, uh, hey, not a problem, sell like 10,000 a month uh, by selling 10 or 20 of the printers, and that bootstraps your your further R&D into open source hardware to so that we, we can all together finish the Global Village construction set by 2028 and move on to applications of all sorts, from micro factories okay. to, to resilient communities. But that's a, that's a general idea. I was the the offer is. I mean, uh, what I was going to say is, can we find some students and the infrastructure to support them to take this on as a serious effort, like like as a community economic development project? So so I would see people like um, whatever, like Chamber of Commerce getting involved, or or people like scores service scores of retired executives. Uh, where the student would be supported by a mentor, a person like you who can show them around in a in a shop. There needs to be a facility, and there needs to be some some funding for the basic production infrastructure. Because what I would see, like if you want to produce printers, kits, I have a cluster. Right now, I have eight printers, but I think a minimum viable cluster is like six printers to get into good production, where you can just meet orders and crank out yeah. like 20 printers in a weekend or whatever. Uh, basically for like a hundred printer basic like hundred printer per month capacity if you want to do that but um, not necessarily seeing the reason for that um, going that much I think like 20 30 uh, machines per month would oh, be a good good I just do. Shit. good thing initially um, so so this huh Dan's gone you did something yeah um audio is gone oh uh, audio i think you're muted okay sorry yeah I'm back. so you're talking about that is really interesting marchen because i think for the if we had the an oce chicago chapter osc uh, like you, where you get oc OCE. osc OSC. Open source. OSC, sorry. OSC. Open source ecology, Chicago chapter, then maybe the fab shop would be the model for that. Like, that would, like, we would. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Sell machines here locally, and then that would become that self sustaining project. And then that'd be another example of it working in an urban environment. And then at some point, I'd want to consider using your same machines because we, we would want the machines to be the same whether it's urban or rural, right? Or are you okay, okay with them being slightly different? No, no, you got a tool chain degeneracy is a big deal. If you ever, okay. so, so we're not into just random design like Fab Labs. Like Fab Labs don't cover collaborative design as far as I can tell. Collaborative design would mean that you narrow down to specific tools, both software and hardware that you use so that when you're developing everybody's on the same page not like oh this is different than yours it's just impossible mm -hmm. to scale that without what I call tool chain degeneracy meaning yep. you're degenerating that to a small set that can do everything but it's uniform for everybody just like it's like okay to give you a metaphor with software it's like if people were not <laughs> I guess the metaphor in software would be like if people were using differ different compilers to get the same source code and the compiler would produ produce different different instances of the code. That's what toolchain degeneracy is. You got to have that identical, so that you don't get the variability of results. So this this is about quality control of the final products. If we're selling products, it's about getting uniform 
scalable prototyping results if people are prototyping so we can compare things yeah. that are same um, it's just part of distributed quality control so the, the introduction yeah. of the word distributed quality control that's something that I'm not really aware of anyone that does distributed quality control but that's what we want to do if you want to talk about a distributed economy yeah. you have to talk about mechanisms where where quality control is done in a distributed way and it starts with the tool chain itself so it would have to be um, pretty much uniform so that would require me to buy into the uh, OSE designs, which I might do. But I think that the best way for me to do that is probably come and build one of your machines. And then I would be able to determine whether I think Chicago should do yeah. it. Yeah, and it's, yeah, and it's, um, it's you, yeah, you, you or somebody else. Like, obviously you, you as a stakeholder would be a good person to do that. Um, we'd want to find somebody like, I mean, you've got a job, you're, you're already doing some things, right? We can't just pull you yeah. out. We're talking more about well, startup. no. There's been discussion of me going on a sabbatical. Okay, yeah. So you you may be the candidate, but yeah. it would require like when I look at the program. I mean, it has to be pretty much. It's it's going to have to be a full time commitment if you're committed to doing something that will work. And, and yeah, how long did you just say? You said it was over a year, right? I think the learning curve for that. I mean, I spec'd out a basically a year year's worth of activity already, like in fifty lessons. But that's easy. It easily covers that. So you're talking about okay. building a com building a 3D printer from scratch, understanding how to build an extruder, a heated bed, the controller, everything, and then there's software, the collaborative aspect of how do you collaborate on a on a larger scale, using basic protocols and and FreeCAD uh, software that's accessible to anybody. And why we also just to to note like what's up with FreeCAD? Well, I mean we can't do what we need to do with anything else. For example, right now. One of our guys is designing, he's, he's already, we already have a 3D printer design workbench, a workbench where you drag and drop components so you make various different iterations of the 3D printer in front of your eyes. A novice can do that now because we programmed that in and that's possible only because FreeCAD allows itself to be extensible and she can program up anything that you want to do. So, so um, G. Roquez, our guy here, he's... Um, so he's doing the workbench construction set right now in FreeCAD where we're going to be doing that for every single machine. So when we have the torch table, here's the torch table designer for different variations. Here's the tractor designer for all the variations. Um, but of course we couldn't do that with software unless it's open source uh, and FreeCAD meets the bill and you can get nice uh, basically drag and drop interfaces where you can design all of that in there. So FreeCAD would be a part of that if we want and and we're talking about we're not talking about you know flight in the night effort it's we're talking about a long-term effort to change the technosphere we're talking about a 10-year program till 2028 that's like eight years actually only eight years mm -hmm. but beyond that uh open source the civilization's technosphere so your your solenoids your hydraulic motors electric motors components making metal and all that's that's all available to any community to to bootstrap civilization from local resources same old same old the you know the fab lab or fab cities promise that's never been delivered yet um yeah but we're looking at i don't it as think it's i don't think it's possible under the current model they have either yours is a better bet and i think what's the I've limit to their model what, what do you see in the way their model works well, it's because it's one of the big ones is because they're not standardizing. How do you, you know, like yeah. how do you have people build machines? And, uh, and I think more importantly, how do you have people share their knowledge of building machines unless you're building standard machines like you're doing? And then you're right, FreeCAD is the way to go. I have it installed on this computer. I've been using it for tool pathing, CNC tool pathing. Exactly. And I've been mess messing around with it. And it's it's almost there. Like I used it about four years ago and it was horrible, right? I just, I'm like, nope, done. But it's getting to the point in the next couple of years where I could see me switching to it completely. For but, example, Toolpath uh, has got full 2.5D capacity right now. Yeah, that's why I'm using it. Oh, you're, yeah, yeah, so you're you're using it for your project in, in Fab Academy or? Yeah, I, I haven't successfully got tool paths into a machine yet, but I've run tool paths, I've done roughing and yeah. uh, finished cuts. You know, I'm a, I've been in tool shops before, so I know, I know nice. the process too. And it's it's awesome. It's unbelievable, actually, FreeCAD. That, and then Neil convinced me to look at it again. He's like, Dan, look at FreeCAD, give it a chance. And I did it. So nice. Neil knows what's required. And, and then Neil is a huge believer in the full 
open source tool chain. So yeah, I understand what you're saying. I have to think about that for a while. Uh, I sent you a response back, and part of the issue with uh, um, with the setup I have now is I have a lot of inventory of standardized machine parts that I need to burn through for this uh, fab shop. Like I can't let those go to waste. Um, and those are maker slide and stuff like that. Like, you know, I have thousands of feet of that. Um, but while I'm doing that, I'm gonna have in the back of my mind, like, okay, what about OSE? How would this, you know, work? And I have looked, I saw your drag and drop uh, tool chain stuff on the documentation for the 3D printer. I looked at the 3D printer pretty carefully. Um, and I use the, I use that same rep wrap uh, display. Yeah on some of my printers so i'm familiar with the boards and all that kind of stuff and i can see how you're standardizing it well actually it, goes, have... it goes a little deeper i'm actually talking to so crowd supply you know the crowd you know crowd supply no it's a mm -hmm. kickstarter for hardware they're quite libre okay. friendly but the discussion there will be like i'm going to see if they're interested if we could do the the high temperature printer with them it's a crowdfunding for a hardware thing uh, okay. but there's a deeper proposition that is okay let's look at the now the parts like i want to make the power supplies the inductive sensors the controller boards the arduinos that has to happen i cannot be sourcing that we cannot keep continue continuing forever to source that from china that's just ridiculous yeah it should be made so, here and it's just a basic basic notion of saying okay well let's just look a little deeper and it's certainly the COVID definitely pushed me into that Mm -hmm. And it's not a big deal. You talk about now you add your fab tool chain for electronics, so CNC milling and pick and place machines. And then for the small metal parts, you're talking about open source screw machines, which the universal axis plus rotary axis and its scalable instance can get you that readily. And that's a, it's almost like a low hanging fruit project for the universal axis application, including material feed that feeds through a big 12 inch chuck like all of that like screw machine it, give me a team of a thousand people will have it done over a weekend um, I could run a process like that because it's all modular. So, okay. I do have a question based on that because you're, you're like if you get that to work yeah. you're tooling up for mass production so are you talking about just building for yourselves or are you talking about building to make money to sustain the community we're talking about reinventing the industrial system so it's anything so you're talking about your sm small mom and pop shop for your own operation replacing mm -hmm. industrial equipment at GM and SpaceX I mean competitive meets or exceeds in industry standards eventually with enough eyeballs on it we're yeah. saying no you got to do the the full thing that works for a full thing that works you, you can't this is not hobby this is about stuff that works and has has to be industrial grade that's one of our basic basic aims an immediate sense it would be producing all the parts like for example the say the heat brakes the the heater blocks mm -hmm. heat sinks readily doable uh, and that, that needs to happen in fact we can create a huge value proposition saying first printer in the world made in the USA or made in Sweden yeah. or made in Germany made not locally. like not like made in USA with 100% Chinese parts. Yeah, kind of right. Deal. I, um, I totally agree that. with you, and that, that's very exciting. Yeah, and, and, that, and that I think we can sell. That's that's a value proposition. That's something that is, uh, I would say, a, an important question. There, are, you know, there are, we we like to work on important questions. That is an important question. So it's not a question whether that that has value. The question is, can we execute on that and deliver that to the world? But that's the that's the context for getting the chapters involved. It's we're saying, mm, hey, okay. that's, that's going to take a little bit more than our mud hut in Missouri to do that. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to need a little help. Uh, I don't think there's any limits as far as the software or knowledge or technological um, blocks to this. It's it's collaborative process and bodies, <laughs> bodies yeah. on deck. For which reason, the next thing we're looking at is um, I want to do this experiment on Extreme Enterprise where we're putting together like 200 to 1,000 people over a weekend and see if this scales like we think it does by the radical modular task division and agile 
process to do that. So, so very careful role allocation task breakdown for a massive collaboration process. That's what we need to get to. Uh, in fact, I, I don't think we can do without that if we talk about the 2028 deadline. We've got like 30 machines that we haven't even touched or so, about 20 or 25, or about half we hardly have touched. And everything that we have touched, uh, I mean, take a look at the printer. I don't think we can say that's a printer that's, you know, an open source printer if it's got all, all components made in China. Yeah, and then yeah. most of those guys have ripped off the designs without giving any credit back to the original designer. Yeah. So there's a lot of work. Um, That's the point. There's a lot of work. We're going to need, I see need the bodies on deck and the method where we do get this to productization in rapid time. Like we, we know we can build things in rapid time. Now we need to get to that design stage in rapid time. And already we've reduced the prototyping cycles from months to, to, to days or weeks by module based design like prototyping the tractor, we can build one, build a completely new iteration starting with design in a week um, based on modular, based modular design where you're reusing the universal power units, frames, drive systems, hydraulic systems. And you just so, like, literally I like, a construction um, set. Yeah, and I see a lot, there's gonna be convergence between Fab Shop and what you're doing at some point. And that's the point where I could switch. Um, in a couple of years, I think we'd be there, and that would be exciting. I think that there'd be interest from people in Chicago to build the welder and some of the tools and the lathe oh, yeah. and, the mill and machines like that because there's a lot of people interested in, and I'm interested in it, in um, democratizing the industrial manufacturing military complex to the point oh, yeah. where individuals can use it, and that's what you're doing. Yeah, so, exactly. Oh, talking so about the welder, actually, you know, interesting you bring that up because I don't know if you've ever seen those $40 200 amp Chinese welders. Well, they seem to yeah. be for real. But something like that, that, that would actually be like an excellent product for the Extreme Enterprise Sprint. I was thinking yes. about it. It's like either like electric motor. The, the other candidate for the, the Extreme Enterprise would be something like electric motor coupled to maybe like an air purifier for COVID, like office space, which filters if, if you've got like 100 square foot area in an office where it's actually safe for you regardless if someone else has COVID next to you. Like maybe, maybe do some kind of a sprint uh, Extreme Enterprise event around a product like that. But we got to like in these Extreme Enterprise things, we got to be getting down to the underlying components like the electric motors and other things, the welders yeah. and the power supplies, power which you supplies, have a power supply, inductive sensors, like those yeah. are all, you know, you just got to peek inside what's in there. But like, for example, right now, if that if and we use this kind of a unique height sensor right now, but if the Chinese guys stop making them, like, OK, what do we do? Well, yeah. we're guaranteed to run into that. It may not be next year, it might be like three years from now, we're going to have to do take care of that issue sometime might as well do it now and, and create more value out of that right now yeah Neil Neil's convinced me about the electronics circuits that we should mill all our own boards and make all our own boards and then solder everything on there that's the way to go yeah you that's know? a definite uh, doable thing for uh, I think that could also mix with like even if it's an open design I think the policy of dual possibility so design it for DIY millability with a DIY circuit mill a, a small scale circuit mill but also make it yes. such that if you want a thousand of these because you got you want to make a thousand respirators by by next weekend then you can just send it off to a board shop and you get the thousand boards if you want to do that like it, it could be both like so someone who doesn't have a circuit mill they can wait two weeks pay three dollars to yeah get it right from a exactly shop. they could have a board house they have osh park do it there's Osh's there's park, yeah. there's people in the united states that make them you sure. know there's board shops in the nis the um yeah. i just sent you when you were talking about pick and place i had a really long conversation with peter ziba yeah who is the he's the founder of this analytics lounge in chicago which is open source science oh cool um and he has taken apart um, like Haas Mill and then rebuilt it and get it running again. He's a really heavy duty kind of guy. And I think that he might be a candidate if you could find grant funding for him to do your year long thing. I think he'd be totally into it. And he was he was yelling at me the other day like a like a 
zealot. Um, he's like, why don't we have pick and place machines where you can just go and make your own circuits? I don't understand why anybody doesn't understand why that's important to make your own circuits or sending everything to China. He was just going on and on about it. Well, and, I mean, and he's very into that. And he also wants to democratize machine tools and stuff like that. Mm hmm. So I think, and he's not doing anything right now. He doesn't, I don't know if he has a job right now. He might be a candidate, and he's really passionate. And he's a smart guy. So that's that's a, one of your potential students there. I sent you his LinkedIn page. And then... Um, yeah, excellent. I don't have his, let me check to see if I've got his email. He's, he's very much like me, where he likes to just communicate in person. I have his phone number, that's it. And actually, I didn't even really know yeah. his last name. And, and it's interesting, like, because you see places like Adafruit Industries. I mean, yeah. it's great. It's, you know, you got open source so-called hardware. I mean, it is open source. But then if the production tool chain is completely proprietary, then, I mean, what does that mean for open source? You certainly cannot produce those things yourself. The so the thing we propose is the distributive idea, make the tool chain definitely open source as well. So if someone wants to go off on their own and do it, they can too. They can come yeah. up, come for the quick learning in an immersion context. They can they can do it themselves if they're motivated. All the options are there. It's it's completely open to which route you want to choose and because the information is open out there. That's the that's the whole part everybody's not focused on and you are is that we need to have the means for production democratized. The right. means the part like the the circuit board designs the autofruit should open source their pick and place programming like they're not getting it that's that's real open source in my opinion we're, well we're they can't open source it because they're using proprietary machines i mean so they would have to have a deliberate effort to actually okay we're going to say hey now we're going to open source our, to our tool chains and create that as the new value proposition and if they did that i, I would definitely buy more stuff from them <clears throat> yeah, right. I, I, it would be good for the their business. It, it, it's a completely new, new game for how they're doing business. Yeah, I don't know. That's a long like. That's once not you start so far away. I mean, there are open really? source PNP machines. You look, Google that. Uh, go to our wiki. Look at open source PNP. Uh, they're out there already. It's, it means that we coordinate with these guys, see if they're really willing to collaborate on taking this to a, an industrial grade model. Because all of some all of the that. capacity I'm, out there is yeah. pretty impressive. They're, they can do the tiniest, yeah. like those machines that are actually open source, they can do yep. those tiniest components too, ones you can hardly see. <laughs> yeah, that's I see really that. Doable. And what's, what's hard though is, and you know this already, um, I want to do that. And the uh, as soon as you start talking about democratizing that far, a lot of people shut down because they, th they think that it's going to cut into their profit or whatever. I think that's the opposite. I think it'll actually create this environment where people can really make a lot of money if they're sharing. It'll change things. It'll take the, the control out of the hands of the few and put it into the many. And that's what I want. Yeah. No, exactly right. But that's also a quick vetting of where along the spectrum of open culture they are. You run that line yeah. by them, and they either tell you you're smoking crack, or they get really excited. Yeah. And right. that way um, you can um, vet people really quickly. And interesting that I had a couple experience because I'm that's what I'm calling out for. Um, and I had a couple of interesting conversations like that last week. Two people were like, "You're smoking crack." Other people were like, "Yeah, this is this is cool." Like you're you're one of them that think that is this is cool. So we got to build a team of people who actually believe it like that. That's our vetting. It's a yeah. really quick test of where people stand. Right. Yeah, you're right. It is, and then you then you then you don't waste time on somebody else. Um, well, the, it's true because a lot of times the vetting vetting process in, in open source, you, it's like you go way down, and then you find out. Oh, by the way, I, I'm not going to be open source. You know, when when the initial conversation is, oh yeah, it's absolutely open source. You know, blah blah blah, this and that, and then it goes way down, and you see that they're not. So it, that part is actually important for just for practicality or just organ, just execution yeah. on this. And I need a little bit of work to get there. Like I should switch over to FreeCAD. I'm still using OnShape, so you know I have to make some changes. But I'm sure you guys weren't always using FreeCAD either. There's probably some. No, else we were using SketchUp that. until FreeCAD got good enough in 2016. Yeah. Okay. 
All right. I think Peter Zeba, I'm going to let him know about you guys. I think he might be a candidate. There's, I think there's other people in Chicago that are coming to mind that would want to build some of the machines here, the OSC machines. So I'm going to kind of start exploring that over the next months to a year because this is a long arc, and I want to make sure I want to think about it some more too. Okay, this was great. Thank you for spending so much time. You know, I know you guys got a lot going on. And as I move forward with the fab shop and get that rolling and that's up and running, then then I'll it'll be time for me to come back and look at this, I think. When and then if I lose fab, if uh, I lose if I lose my job, then it might happen sooner. <laughs> right. Uh, when's um as far as your fab final project, when is that due? I gotta have a machine built this week. Okay. And that's like so. pretty much this week is the end of the program or? That's if I want to show it off for the um, FabX conference. Are you going to be speaking at that? Oh yeah, I think I'm going to apply for that. Yeah, I haven't haven't yet. Yeah, I'd like to apply for Should. that. They're looking for speakers. Yeah. So you can go to the FabX website. Um, you can just type in FabX yep. Fab Lab. I got the and, email on that. Yeah. Okay, great. Yeah, and then I want to present my machine at, machine at that. So that's my motivation. And I still have a lot of design work left to do, and I got a lot to do this week. And that'll be the first machine in the Fab Shop series. It'll be the CNC foam cutter, which will cut RC airplanes because that's what I want to make. And then it'll also make uh, foam patterns for sand casting. Yeah, that's cool. And yeah. as far as the entire, like for example, what you're doing in Fab Academy right now, is that all completely online, including the lectures? Like you have yeah. recordings of everything? Yeah. So the repo I sent you earlier, um, which I think you got in your notes. Yeah, my Fab Academy uh, link there. It says fabacademy.org. Yeah. yeah. That's 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 all my homework. But as far as but what I mean by is the actual curriculum that that Neil is teaching is that all that's all online, including the presentations or just yeah. The text? So you have a, you have you have the link there too. It's a couple above. That's it's uh, Fab Academy 2020. It has my fab shop concept if you just chop off and go to fabacademy.org all the materials there uh, are all the recitations are there up there too yeah so if you it's neil it's a very simple website right mm -hmm. fabacademy.org see here let's see if it's right oh man this is not right okay let me send you the right one baloney they have like a landing site that hides it all this is the problem, people. Yeah, I don't know why they did that. So for 2020, and then you can just go back in years by changing this link. So here's the link to 2020 and all the curriculums there. It's got the schedule. It's got the students like me. It's got documents. Oh, there's prior years, too. You can also what search. What about, uh, does it actually student. have the, I mean, Neil does lecture, right? Yep, so you click on schedule. Oh, video. Yeah. yeah. There's the whole course. He doesn't care who takes it. You can take it on your own if you wanted to after it's... And so at, at the next day he has the video posted. So the video recitation with you is in here. The video is up there? Yeah, so it's uh, June 1st, machines, video. And the video is you and the other guys talk about machine building, which I was really sad to not see more people show up to that recitation. Oh, yeah, it's um, there. And yeah. then let's see. Awesome. So that so that so that's a great way to study that uh, if, if we want to do... Because definitely, like, I'd like to see the Fab Academy be completely based around collaborative design because what you guys do right now is everyone gets, uh, gets an individual project. Well, what if everybody collaborate on something that actually works? <laughs> it yeah, could actually be turned into a real product. At, at each yeah, Fab Academy, that's... new machine, screw machine in this one, or part of a screw machine, uh, induction furnace in the next one, welder, and it actually works and it's industrial grade. I mean, that's, that's the promise. Um, that's how I would do it if I were doing it. You're, you're the uh, OSC is a better bet for that. That would be a hard sell for these guys. <laughs> For wh who guys, the the actual participants or the, the administration? I, I think both. Yeah. They're really stuck in their ways. They're academics. 
Right. Yeah. I mean, academia is but you're uh, right. it's not highly you're right. collaborative. I, I can't say academia is highly collaborative. I mean, the notion is that, of course, it's super, super collaborative, but I think it's far from it. I mean, just the model that you, you got like a little crew of people working on a paper and they're competing with other people producing the yeah. same paper and stuff right. like that. Let's, what if we were to say, let's solve a bigger problem and work together on that, uh, then we can yeah. be talking about solving different problems. I totally agree. Um, but what, ask Neil about that. Maybe he would do it. Like this is, this he does, I don't know if he actually gets paid for this even. He kind of does this as because he loves it. Yeah. And one of, one of the things that we have an issue with Neil is that we ask him to change the bill of materials to update it to more modern stuff. He won't do it. Like he's very like mo more. Mo what do you mean? Mo what more modern stuff like com new components or? Yeah, like he should ditch the AT Tiny controllers and he should have a different type of controller in there by now. Like it's time to move on to something new. Um, mm -hmm. But I don't know. On the other hand, he's got a point that it should stay there for legacy reasons. But you know he's he runs it a certain way and it's neil's way and that's it so it'd be it'd be interesting to propose to him that to have everybody build the same machine because i think you would learn better oh you'd, you'd increase your learning you're, yeah. you're not like yeah. reinventing your own mistakes you're learning from others i mean scrum principles say that you should at least do two people that's industry standard so you so you could in programming or effectiveness of learning you should do at least two people so yeah. that's that's a start. Um, and then increase that to the whole crew. And, but that becomes yeah, exactly. a totally different kind of a game. It's now it's a training and collaboration, not not self indulgence. <laughs> that's exactly why I'm doing Fab Shop because there I need to prepare my high school students for Fab Academy because I want some of them to take it. But just taking a high school student that's been in a Fab Lab and dropping them right into Fab Academy that's that's really rough. Yeah. So the fab shop will be a standard set of equipment to do exactly what you're talking about. They learn and they do it together. I'm there to help them. And then they could handle something like Neil's fab Academy where it's, you know, it's, it's, it's rough. It's an MIT course. Yeah, you're right. There needs to be this standardized equipment for everybody to learn together. Then all the modifications come after that on the standardized equipment. Yeah, that's okay. Well, anyway, uh, the open source microfactory or Fab Lab is still to be delivered. That's a problem statement. That was that. <laughs> when did Fab come out? In 2003, was it? Or 2011? It was it's like a decade or two old 2005, idea. 2005, 2005, roughly. Yeah, well, is one idea that's uh, emerged. Just for historical purposes, that has not been delivered yet, and it's, uh, no. it's about time. So. Um, yeah. Hey, okay. I gotta get going. So yep. you guys got nice my next meeting. Thanks later. a lot for talking. Bye bye. Bye bye. Good stuff. Bye bye.